we return to our coverage of the Senate Governmental Affairs Subcommittee on Investigations as members hear testimony on U.S. handling of communist bloc defectors. Our next witness is Dr. Lawrence Martin Bittman, professor at Boston University. Doctor, we appreciate you being here. We swear in all our witnesses. You swear the testimony you give for this subcommittee to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bittman, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate your patience in waiting to testify this morning. We have been interrupted by one roll call vote, and some of the testimony took a little longer than we anticipated, but we are very much looking forward to your testimony, and we welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I prepared a lengthy statement, uh, about 48 pages, that I would like to be inserted in the record as if read, and then I'll make a shorter statement uh, about some major issues concerned with defectors. Your full statement will be part of the record without objection. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, I am a defector. The word in American perception has a clearly negative connotation. During the last 19 years, I have met many Americans who felt embarrassed to say the word defector in my presence because they didn't want to offend me. They thought it was not polite to put that label on me. I don't agree. Defection, according to Webster's dictionary, means abandonment of principle, abandonment of loyalty or desertion. I think that's what I did but I abandoned the system of deceit and secrecy. I deserted the system that suppresses the most elementary hu human rights. Regardless of what people think of me, I cannot think of myself as a traitor. In, on August 21st, 1968, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, crushed the movement for democratic socialism, and betrayed every principle of human decency and international law. I defected because of the Soviet invaders. I abandoned my loyalty to the communist system, whether Soviet or Czechoslovak style. I'm glad that I defected. It was the only acceptable choice I had unless I wanted to cooperate with the Soviet occupation forces. I don't have a problem with uh, the word defector and I don't hide my past in front of my colleagues or students. I spent six years under the authoritarian Nazi regime, 20 years as a member of the Communist Society and Communist Party, and the last 19 years as a resident and citizen of the Libertarian American Society. I have learned that for a journalism professor concerned with communication barriers and complexities of the communication environment around the world, my life experience is an asset rather than a liability. In the last 15 years, I have helped to educate some 3,000 students who work now as journalists in Asia, Africa, Western Europe, Latin America, and here in the United States. Many of them are still in touch, sharing their successes and failures with me. One thing that I would like to add, one of them is living in the here in Washington, and he's the recipient of Pulitzer Prize, my former student, and I'm very proud of it. Why is it important to discuss the subject of defectors and resolve the basic problems and mistakes of the past? In the ongoing competition and struggle between the first world and the second world, or more specifically between the United States and the Soviet Union, defectors play quite an important role. Communist countries consider propaganda, covert action, and intelligence operations important foreign policy tools. When we compare the two largest intelligence services in the world, the KGB and the CIA, it is quite obvious that the Soviets dominate the field of human intelligence. I do, not believe, uh, I, I do not believe that we will ever match the number of secret agents they command in various parts of the world. But in comparison with the Soviets, we have one great advantage, defectors. Every year, a number of prominent communist officials, artists, journalists, military officers, intelligence operatives defect. They bring with them a large volume of important political, military, economic, and national security information vital for our defense. 
Our knowledge of the decision-making process in the Soviet bloc depends largely on information obtained from defectors. The Soviet superiority in human intelligence is outweighed by vital information brought in by defectors. There are many potential defectors in the Soviet Union, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, East Germany, and other communist countries. If we allow more cases like the Yurchenko case to happen, we will only hurt ourselves. <coughs> many potential defectors will abandon their plans because they will be afraid that they may eventually end up back in the Soviet Union as Yurchenko did. I think it is important that after this inquiry by the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, we establish a system that will eliminate the basic mistakes in the treatment of defectors. A system that will smooth rather than complicate the process of their adjustment to American society. Defectors from communist military and intelligence services, for example, should be debriefed and handled by individuals who are not only experts in their fields, but also experts in human psychology, capable of handling defectors' trauma on a professional level. A defector from a communist country comes to the United States because of serious political, religious, moral, or economic conflicts with the values and practices of his own culture and political environment. The conflict and its resolution, that is defection, is followed by an inevitable process of abandoning his old value system and accepting the value system of the new country. It's a very painful process accompanied by an intense feeling of loneliness and isolation. The individual realizes only after the defection how strong the bond to his native country is. The emotional turmoil is further aggravated by a sense of the permanent loss of family members, friends, and fa familiar surroundings. In Eastern Europe, friendship is very important, and many defectors and political refugees complain about what they call superficiality and the lack of deep bonds among Americans. Back there, they say, one can be very open with close friends and immediate family members. Without this supportive circle of trusted individuals, the defector feels lonely and abandoned in a confusing, hostile world. The psychological trauma of defection is accompanied by feeling of guilt, nightmares, and suicidal thoughts and tendencies. The defector is concerned about what his closest friends and family members will think about his defection. He worries about his public image when the news about his defection appears in the press. He has to fight a major battle with himself to overcome the feeling of guilt. If he is unable to rationalize and accept his defection as the right decision and sees himself as a traitor, his trauma will develop into a serious, long-lasting crisis. In that case, he becomes a candidate for suicide, drug, or alcohol addiction, or eventually may decide to go back and face the ultimate punishment which unconsciously he thinks he deserves. Very few intelligence operatives turned defectors are able to find suitable jobs in professions where they can use their educational, analytical, and language skills. Academic institutions, think tanks, and research centers which could benefit from the intellectual and professional, professional talent among prominent defectors do not easily accept somebody who is recommended by the CIA. Most American academics, even those with conservative political leanings, do not like governmental intrusions into their fields. A request to put an unknown, untested defector on the payroll of an academic institution at a time when there are many, uh, not many jobs available for American applicants is perceived as risky business both financially and politically. In the spring of 1986, I prepared a proposal to establish a fellowship at Boston University that would be awarded to a political refugee or a defector from a communist country or from an authoritarian third world country. Boston University, the academic officials and, and the administration supported the idea and encouraged me to proceed. And this proposal focused on two major objectives. One, to create a vehicle for talented researchers and political writers among defectors, 
uh, for their smoother integration into American society. And the second objective, to collect information about media manipulation, about propaganda, disinformation from refugees and defectors from communist countries, people who were directly involved in anti-American activities, just like I was 20, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, this summer, the idea became a reality when uh, J.M. Olin Foundation decided to support this proposal with a $20,000 grant. And a month ago, uh, the first J.M. Olin Fellow for the study of international propaganda and disinformation came to Boston. He will spend 12 months at Boston University working on a study concerned with current Soviet communication policies. Uh, this is uh, my small contribution to problems of defectors, and I would like to encourage you know, other universities to establish simi similar vehicles for uh, helping talented researchers, writers, uh, and teachers uh, from among defectors to enter uh, productive life in this country. I want to thank the chairman and all members of the subcommittee for giving me the opportunity to share with them my experience and recommendations on, on the subject of great importance to our, our national security. Thank you, Dr. Bidman, for your very helpful and insightful testimony. You've already alluded to it in your statement to some extent, but could you summarize for us the primary psychological problem, the problems that occur with a defector in the first few months or a year or two after he or she defects? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, several witnesses mentioned uh, the trauma of, uh, and, and the adventure of defection, but uh, it is, I think, nothing in comparison with the psychological trauma that starts when the individual lands in the United States, when he, when he realizes all consequences of his action, when he has to accept this as a, uh, as, as a permanent solution, that is, the individual goes into very serious psychological crisis. He has to abandon all the whole value system that, that had meaning in his life. That is, in, in my case, I was educated in a communist society. For many years, I sincerely believed in the ideology of, of the communist society, in Marxism-Leninism, in, in parties' directives. Uh, it, it, it means to abandon this, this old system and create a new one, but that, that cannot be done from one day to another. It's a very long, very, very traumatic process. Uh, then, of course, the, the feeling of guilt. Most defectors have very, very strong feeling of guilt, doubts whether this was the right thing to do or not. And uh, uh, this is uh, the something that, that they have to fight with themselves and accept. And again, it's not a matter of few weeks or months. I would say it took me probably about four years to, to find myself and become more or less a normal member of this society. What year was that that you came to the United States? I came in 1968, uh, shortly after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. What was the main reason you came, to, you decided to come to the United States? Uh, the first few days, I didn't know where to go. I was. Uh, uh, no, but why, I, why did you decide to come? Yes. Well, I decided, uh, I, when I finally made this decision, I, I realized that this was the only country that, first of all, can use the knowledge I have about Soviet bloc intelligence operations around the world and uh, uh, can do something about uh, the Soviet penetration of the West in an effective way, rather than to go to Australia or Sweden or, or uh, uh, another country. Uh, so this, this, was, uh, this was the major reason for me why I came to the United States. Why did you decide to leave Czechoslovakia? Uh, the ultimate, uh, the most important reason was the fact of Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. It was a political shock for me when I woke up in the morning of August 21st, 1968. At that time, I was stationed in Austria under diplomatic cover as a press attaché of the Czechoslovak embassy. And uh, I woke up and uh, realized that Czechoslovakia was invaded. So the same day I made a statement in Austrian television against the invasion and I stayed for another three weeks or so working, trying to communicate with uh, liberal elements in Prague, supplying them with information. Uh, but then of course uh, I realized that this was uh, uh, 
When you did left, you, you, were, did, you believed in Marxism at that stage, is that right? Uh, I wouldn't say that in August 1968 I was a Marxist-Leninist. I was not, no. I would, realistically, I would, put, I, I would categorize my political thinking as a social democrat. I wouldn't admit it publicly at a party meeting, but I was not a Marxist-Leninist anymore. You'd already, before that the invasion, you'd already stopped so that belief. That's right. What were the major problems you encountered when you came to the United States, in your own experience? The insecurity of the future, how to start, uh, where to go, how to, how, how to start a new career, uh, because I didn't know anybody. Uh, Did you speak English then? No. That, uh, I think that was a very important uh, help that I received from the CIA during the debriefing, debriefing period that they uh, provided me with a tutor and uh, three years later I was able to start teaching at a prominent American university. Did uh, you get help in getting your job at the university? No. I was lucky enough to meet a gentleman who had courage to provide me with this fir first oppor opportunity. Dr. Manning White, chairman of the journalism department at Boston University, with whom I uh, drove for three and a half hour hours in a car and told him about myself, and he said, well, okay, why, why don't I give you an opportunity, you know, next semester you can start starting, you can start teaching uh, on a part-time basis one course dealing with international press problems. He didn't call CIA, he didn't call, uh, call FBI. It was just a gesture of an American who cared. I'll be grateful to this individual to the rest of my life, that he had the courage uh, to do that. Uh, and this is, uh, Another side of what I call Americanism, uh, you know, many, pe many people say Americans are naive, politically naive. Yes, many are, but this is the other side. To believe, to, to, uh, to give a chance of a newcomer who comes under very, very difficult circumstances and conditions. What do you teach at Boston University? Well, for the first 10 years, everything far away from my previous specialization, that is, history of American journalism, methodology of journalism research, public opinion formation, uh, international press problems. And it was in 1980 that the university asked me to offer a course on disinformation and the press, something that I was involved in for uh, nearly 14 years, <coughs> including two years as a deputy commander of the Czechoslovak disinformation department. And I have been teaching that course uh, for the last five years, uh, which is a very popular course now among journalism students. What's the name of that course? Disinformation and the Press, dealing with the techniques of mass media manipulation. And that was what you were charged with. That was your responsibility before you defected. That's correct, yes. You were head of the disinformation desk of Czechoslovak intelligence. Yes, that's correct. A deputy commander of and the And so department. you now teach a course in that. Is that... That's an unusual course, isn't it? Uh, well, a, a little unusual, but I want to emphasize in order to prevent any misinformation uh, about in, in the media <laughs> that we are not offering a course teaching young American journalism students how to deceive anybody. This is a course designed to help them realize uh, how mass media are being manipulated, what, what, what are the objectives, what is the mechanism of these games, because we believe that this solid, broad knowledge is the best protection of press freedom in the United States. <coughs> what do you uh, suggest the United States government do, if anything, about the way we handle defectors now, both those who have intelligence backgrounds and those who would have governmental backgrounds that would not be of particular interest to the intelligence community? Well, there are a number of things that I would recommend. First of all, uh, I think that people who are involved in the in, in, in handling defectors, they should be experts not only in their field, intelligence, counterintelligence fields, and so on, but also, I think, uh, well educated in the field of human psychology. They have to realize that the, the individual they are dealing with goes through the most traumatic experience of his life, and that uh, he may uh, suddenly, uh, his crisis may, may become. Uh, a tragic crisis, crisis. So this is one thing that the people should be educated in, 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 uh, in the field of human psychology. Uh, 
And second, we should establish a, a system that would help the defectors to find suitable jobs in the United States. I know that it's a complex problem, but one of the solutions, and that's what I'm trying to do, is to establish a system of fellowships across the country with various research institutions, thanks, universities. Uh, if we have, let us say, 10, 15, 20 fellowships uh, for talented writers, researchers, that would help very much. And work study programs with various business companies, uh, institutions where the individual would work, let us say, for three years, land this new job and profession, and then after three years, the company could say, yes, we are very happy with him, we'll keep him. Or he could say, you know, I will try now something new, I know how to live in this open, competitive society, and he will be on his own. But what is necessary th is to help them in the transition period. The first three, uh, four years uh, are very, very difficult for, for, for defectors. Do you have any words of advice relating to the Yurchenko case, the way that was handled? Do you have any particular insights into that? Uh, mm, of course, I, I, I haven't had any access to any, any secret information, but from what I what I have uh, learned from the press, I am uh, very convinced that, uh, that Yuchenka wasn't set he sent here as an agent with some kind of a special mission. Was not. Was not, no, no. He is an individual who went through a very deep personal crisis and he couldn't handle it. And he went home knowing that he would be severely, severely punished. He knew that th this was a very, uh, uh, very difficult decision and he would be severely punished, but he went home to something he knew. That is, he knew how they would treat him. He knew that he would be either executed or sentenced to a long prison term. Uh, and let us not think that because he, he has been visible for a few times that they are not going to punish him. You know, the KGB knows that he defected, that he betrayed the Soviet Union. What we have seen, uh, the, the, the press conferences, that, that is the propaganda show, but Mr. Yuchenko will be put before the military trial and sentenced as a defector, sooner or later. Uh, but uh, obviously the crisis was so deep for him here, he couldn't handle it, and he went back to what, he, what, what were the uh, known elements, factors, uh, behavior of behavior. He knew how he would be handled, and uh, it's, it's a, I think, very tragic case because uh, obviously we could learn much more from Mr. Yuchenko. He could have been much more useful than he was. And that, there is another aspect of this case, namely, of course, this discouraged quite a few potential defectors because there are many, very many people in Eastern Europe who th think about defecting. And a case like the Yuchenko case always stimulates thinking, well, if I do it, maybe I land like him in Moscow or in Prague. This will be, this will be the on end of my story. So this was, uh, I think, uh, this really turned against our interests. Is, has there been any real change in the way the Soviet Union handles defectors over the last few years? Yes, I think that there, there is a visible change in strategy in Soviet handling of defectors until about 1984, 83-84, uh, all immigrants from the Soviet Union, Soviet Jews, everybody who left the Soviet Union, Soviet bloc countries, were considered basically a traitor. And there were few, few Russian Jews who wanted to go back 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, but they were rejected. The Soviets didn't want to let them in. And it was uh, in the last two years that uh, this changed. Now they opened the door for, for, uh, for individuals who left the Soviet Union or even defected, like uh, Oleg Bitov, from, uh, a writer for uh, Literaturnaya Gazeta, uh, and say, well, the door is open for you. You can come back again. Of course, this creates great opportunities for Soviet propaganda, for uh, using this new situation for for intelligence purposes, propagandistic purposes, I think it's much more, uh, they are now much more skillful in, uh, in uh, misusing the phenomenon for, for their own purposes. 
Do you believe those people are going to be punished down the road when they come back, or is this for real, that they aren't going to be punished? That depends on the position of that individual, what, what kind of job, what kind of position he had before defecting. An intelligence officer, there's no doubt, will be severely punished. Uh, uh, an in individual, a regular Soviet Jew who uh, left the Soviet Union and then realized that he couldn't adjust to the American society and, and goes back, I don't think that they will put him in jail, but uh, certainly there will be certain stigma attached to, to him for the rest of his life. But I don't think that they will, they will send, send him to prison. What are the major differences, if any, between the Soviet KGB operation intelligence-wise and Eastern European country intelligence operations? You were in the Czechoslovakian yeah. intelligence. Yes. You probably had close liaison with the KGB. Yes. Should mm -hmm. the United States consider both to be one and the same? Well, uh, uh, all satellite services of, are, of course, uh, under the supervision and uh, command of the Soviet intelligence uh, uh, operatives. There's not a single operation that would, uh, that would be unnoticed by the Soviets. They, they control the whole process of uh, initiating, conducting intelligence operations and getting the results. Uh, now, as far as handling defectors uh, is concerned, there are certain differences, like for example, Hungary for, for years has been much more flexible in dealing with defectors, showing more liberal face to our defectors, actually opening this door before the Soviet Union. Uh, Czechoslovakia established a policy that uh, uh, was mainly, uh, that was designed not only to use or misuse defectors or refugees for political purposes, but also to get a lot of Western currency, uh, dollars, uh, uh, back home, because they encourage refugees to normalize their relations with the mother country. That means that they had to pay something between two and ten thousand dollars for their education they, they receive in Czechoslovakia, and for that they receive the permission to travel freely to Czechoslovakia, visit their relatives, and eventually come back to the United States. So that means that uh, Czechoslovakia received millions and millions of dollars from uh, former refugees, now American or Canadian citizens, who paid uh, eight, ten thousand dollars for the permission to travel to visit their relatives at home. And of course, there was another uh, condition attached that uh, if, if they wanted to belong to that category, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't get involved in any anti-Soviet or anti-communist activities. That means the political restriction on, on their activities abroad in the United States and in Canada and, uh, and other Western countries. <coughs> Dr. Pittman, do you have any other suggestions for the subcommittee or for the U.S. government that you'd like to give us at this time? Well, I have uh, a number of very specific suggestions that I would like to make available to the agencies uh, in, or individuals uh, who will be involved in debriefing and handling defectors in future. I, and I prepare, prepared a very comprehensive uh, material, something around 80 or 90 pages, uh, I, of course, don't intend to talk about it in details because some of it is confidential, but I would like uh, to share this experience of mine with people who are going to handle defectors in future. Well, I know that would be very, very helpful. We'd like for you to stay in touch with us as we go through the hearings. We're going to have a series of recommendations to make at the end, and we'd welcome your views um, as we go along if you have any additional views to supplement your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. This completes our witnesses for the first day of what will be at least three days of hearings on this subject. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, we will be back in this room. First witness will be Mr. Leo Chern, Chairman of International Rescue Committee. I've known uh, Leo Chern for a long time. He has many hats. Uh, he is uh, going to be a very fine witnesses for us uh, in this particular area of his expertise. We will then have a panel. We will have uh, two Soviet defectors, Alina Alexandria Kosta and Alexander A. Ustakov. So we will have those two witnesses on a panel. 
We may have other witnesses depending on the time. We have alerted a couple of other witnesses. We may be able to hear from them, but it depends on the length of time for those uh, two different witness groups. 